Здравствуйте, друзья, еще раз. Очень здорово, что все вы вернулись с обеда. Good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, welcome back from your lunch break. We are ready to resume the work of our wonderful TLD CON, the 16th International Conference for CTLD Registries and Registrants of the CI Central and Eastern Europe. Um, next, we're going to welcome a guest, well, not a guest, really, a friend, a standing speaker. Someone who always tries to attend our meetings, be it in person or remotely. We hope very much that soon we'll be able to see each other face to face. But now let me introduce to you John Crane, Senior Vice President and CTO of ICANN. John is going to deliver a presentation on ICANN's comprehensive approach to mitigating domain name system abuse. John, welcome. So happy to see you. Over to you. Thank you. Great to, to be here virtually. Uh, wish I was there in person. Uh, and I've got an echo. Let me just, uh, just see if I can do something about that. I'll, I'll live with it. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm John Crane, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at ICANN. Uh, and I've been asked to come and talk a little bit about what ICANN is doing in the realm of DNS abuse. So <clears throat> any of you who are in the TLD industry or the domain name industry will know this, but ICANN operates under a set of fairly strict bylaws. Um, a core element of our bylaws is that we are responsible for the security and stability of the domain name system, especially where it pertains to um, the generic TLDs. Um, but one of the things that we don't do is deal with issues around regulating content. And you can see our bylaws at this link I've given here. I just wanted to say that up front. So, at ICANN, we have a multifaceted response to DNS abuse. We basically look at this on three pillars. One is about expertise and contributing data. So <clears throat> I'll talk to some of the projects that we do in this area, but this is really about us being part of the community and part of the discussion about what is DNS abuse and how is it occurring. We also, through this, provide some tools, <clears throat> mainly data tools. And then the other side, the big side of what we do is also enforcing our contracts with the generic top-level domain administrators. So let's get into this a little bit. So within the context of ICANN and the contracts with the GTLDs, we've decided on five broad categories of harm. You, know, you should probably be familiar with these um, botnets um, networks of compromised machines basically especially where they are used um, in a manner that they use domain names for their command and control systems that is normally where we can take action in the dns against the botnet um, malware um, especially names used for dropping malware um, Botnets are, of course, related to that because that's often <clears throat> how botnets come about. Farming, um, which is more to do with uh, recursives than the actual registration of names, but sometimes names are used in farming for, for some of the infrastructure. Phishing. And then the fifth one is really a catch-all, which is because we don't generally deal with spam, as it's often a content issue, but we do deal with spam when it is a vector for any of the four above. So <clears throat> spam is not completely off the table. It is on the table when it is being used for the four above vectors. And as I said, we do not regulate contents, um, nor do we have the ability to do that. We don't have relationships, for example, with the hosting providers, etc. So we have a series of projects. Um, many of you may be familiar with this one. It's been going on for many years now. <clears throat> the Domain Abuse Activity Reporting System. 
or DAR. What this does is it assembles reputational data about domain names. It uses a bunch of reputational block lists or RBLs. And we take all of those names in the RBLs. We look to see if they're actually resolving. So we take all of the zone files we can find. And if it's resolving, then we count it as a threat. If it's not resolving at the moment, then we consider it is not a live threat. Um, we compile that data, um, do some number crunching, and we release monthly reports that basically look at the concentration of names with a bad reputation in each TLD. And we're going to start doing that for registrars in the generic space as well, um, now that we have access to some extra data. If you're a country code operator, you can also join the DAR project. Um, quite a few have. Um, we give a slightly different product to the country codes because for each of them, we also give a internal monthly report that helps them see more of what we're seeing than what we say publicly. Um, if you're interested in that as a CCTLD operator, just email global support at ICANN.org. <clears throat> this is just one of the ways you can cut the data in that report that comes out of DAR. This is a percentage of domain names identified as a security threat in the reputation feeds over time. Um, these are the 2012 and afterwards TLDs versus the ones that were prior to that in the generic space. Um, the reason we cut it this way was because there was a fear that the newer names would have a much higher percentage of abuse than the older names. It turns out that the data shows that, in fact, they started lower and they've grown to be about the same. Um, here we're talking um, still about 0.25% of, of, of names in the zone. So it's still um, far below 1%. And that's the average. Many are much, much lower than that. We have a new project. Um, we are not actually running this project. We are paying for it and obviously we are uh, managing the contracts on that. Dr. Majek Korzynski um, works at the Grenoble Institute of Technology in France and he is performing this research. The idea is to look at maliciously registered names, so the names that have been registered specifically for abuse, and to see if we can distinguish or they can distinguish particular drivers for that registration. Now, that could be many things. It could be the policy at the TLD. It could be pricing, or it could be something completely different. We don't know. The uh, study has not been completed yet, and hopefully will be completed later this year. Um, once again, there's a URL in the slides. I will share them afterwards that points to this. So really, it's trying to figure out what is the preference of the attacker or the adversary who is registering the names for malicious purpose. We've done something a little similar at ICANN years ago where we paid an outside firm to do similar work. So we thought it was time to redo that. This should be really interesting because it will hopefully give us some insights as to whether things can be changed, either in operations or policy, that will basically make the bad guys go somewhere else. <clears throat> DNS sticker has been around um, for a little while. We started this when the pandemic broke out. I think we all remember COVID and the pandemic. It was two or three of your of our years where we spent time locked up in rooms very much like this one where I am now in my office. I think I spent two years here. Um, this is basically looking at str strings within names that may relate to a malicious activity. Um, often, the bad guys will make use of any kind of event in the world to try and con people, to try and get um, often funds or to compromise them in such a way that they can drop malware. And they do this by <clears throat> registering names with strings like 
COVID help or you know, we we can cure COVID or names related to any of the various medicines that were out there for COVID. So <clears throat> what we did is we generated a list of thousands of strings related to the COVID pandemic um, in multiple languages and scripts. And where we found those in names that were resolving um, on the internet, mostly in the generic space, we would look at those. We would then go and look for indicators of abuse. Um, those could be reputation lists. Those could be known <laughs> reporters. And then we would actually go out and gather the evidence. So we would do screenshots. We would collect data related to what was being dropped, um, what kind of malware, et cetera. And then we would forward a report to the registrar saying, we found this name. Here is evidence that it is being used in an abusive manner. Please take appropriate action. And what we found is that when we reported a name in that manner with good, solid evidence, registrars would actually take action. They would take the names down or they would suspend them, but they would take appropriate action if you asked them with evidence. And we have a fairly high bar um, for our evidentiary standard because, as I can, we don't want to be um, sending out false positives on this. And we've had no reports of false positives over the few years we've been doing this. As I said, we also do a lot of capacity building. <clears throat> we are in multiple external groups. Um, I know of some of them, the anti-phishing working group, um, MORG, which deals with malware and messaging. Um, FIRST, which is the uh, International Forum for Incident Response Teams and many, many other groups. So we participate in those groups, not only as members and to learn, but also as participants where we are trying to explain to people how the domain name industry works and why we've chosen specific abuse types and the kind of work that we do. We also do capacity development and training on mitigating DNS abuse. Um, we work with law enforcement around the world. Um, you know, we've done this in the US, we've done it in Europe, we've done it in Russia, we've done it um, in Asia. So we've given trainings all over the world to uh, national law enforcement bodies, explaining that to them how the DNS ecosystem works so that they can better take action um, with more knowledge about who to contact and what kind of evidence people often expect. And then there's also a course catalog um, available at ICANN.org slash OXO. So beyond that, our third peer is really the contracts we have with generic TLDs. So in the last year, roughly a year, we've been collaborating with the GLT registries and registrar stakeholders um, at ICANN to see if we can make a tangible change to the contracts. If you read the current contract, what it basically says is that a registry or registrar must investigate and respond to any reports they get of DNS abuse in, in their portfolio. And after talking with the registries and the registrars, we thought it made more sense to tighten that up a little bit and to add the, the requirement to actually mitigate or, DN, or disrupt that DNS abuse. Um, so prior to these changes, or indeed today, because the changes are not yet voted on, the registry didn't have a obligation to mitigate the DNS abuse. This changes that. It's a small change in words. It's only a, really a paragraph or so added to the contract if that actually, because it's, it's mainly just changes to those paragraphs. But it's a big change in what all registries and registrars under ICANN contract must do. So we started negotiating in earnest in January of this year. And we wanted to make this 
as fast as we could because we didn't think this could wait for a long policy process. The discussion was basically that there are some things we can do in the contract now, and there are other things that are going to have to wait for policy discussion. But we thought this small change to the contract was something that we could do in a co- negotiation between the contracted parties and ICANN. You know, ICANN, the registries and registrars being the, the th- three people on the contracts. <laughs> it took us until May to get language, which in ICANN universe is lightning speed. Um, these things normally take a long time. We did that by staying very focused on the narrow objective of adding mitigate and disrupt. And then in May, we actually published the amendments and asked for public comment. Now we've got those public comments that ended in July. At this moment, we are considering those comments along with the um, working group, which is part of the um, contracted parties house, to see if we need to make any amendments and finalize those. You can read all of the contracts at this URL. Once again, I will share the slides after this. But generally speaking, the comments we've got are, we got this right for the small change, but we must have those policy discussions about other elements. Now, some people said they wish we'd done those other elements within the negotiation, but I think that most people understand why we focused on the narrow focus and did not broaden it. Um, One of the issues with policy development is if you try and solve every single problem, you actually end up solving none of them uh, because the development process just takes so long. So we're hoping after we get past this that we can have some smaller policy development discussions where we can take other bites of the apple, so to speak, and solve some other problems with the community. So the next thing that needs to happen is that this has to go to a vote, excuse me. So the registry operators will vote on their contract and the registrar operators will do the same for their agreement with ICANN. These need what we call a super majority. Um, We are very confident that the industry will vote in favor of this, but we do need to get everybody out to vote. So if you are an ICANN accredited registrar or a registry, please do look at these and please do vote. If you don't vote, it becomes a negative vote. So, you know, we'd like everybody to get out and vote, even if they're going to vote against it. We'd we'd like to know that people are actually against it rather than just didn't vote. So please get out and vote. So the other side we do on this is the enforcement side. Obviously, once the contracts are changed, that will allow us to enforce on the obligation to take action to uh, mitigate or disrupt. At the moment, it is on investigate and respond. And the enforcement can arise from pretty much any, anywhere. We, we, If we find evidence that a contracted party is not taking a- action, we can do uh, based on that. But also we get a lot of reports. Now, the important thing here is a lot of the reports we get are from people complaining about abuse but not providing evidence. If you read the contract changes, it's very clear that the contracted parties are going to be expected to take action on well-evident reports of DNS abuse. So sending them a name and just saying this is bad is, and if they don't do much with that, that would not be considered a abuse of the contract or or, or a lack of compliance because there is some onus on the people reporting 
to actually provide evidence of the badness. It's not good enough just to say something is bad. And our compliance team regularly publish metrics um, on the kind of reports they get. And you'll see that there's many thousands of reports come in, but not all of them are actually things they can take action on. So the other side of this is that as an organization, and, and I think most in the community, we believe that it's the community that is best positioned to determine what policy recommendations, if any, are needed to mitigate DNS abuse. So as we go into the next year and we start looking at what policy development processes are needed and who should be involved in those, it really is a call to the community to please get involved in those efforts. Please join the ICAM meetings where these are being discussed either in person or remotely and express your views on what you believe needs to happen in the DNS abuse mitigation space. Because the comments we receive on the contract amendments, many of them did say that while this is a great advancement and it's very important, that we need to do more. So I expect the next years will be years where we talk a lot about what are the different policies we can implement that will help prevent DNS abuse or to mitigate it. With that, it is the end of what I had on my slides, and I wanted to open it up for questions, if that's okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor, please? There aren't any questions. We can't see any. Okay. Oh, but we have. Oh, just wait, 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 wait a second. Okay, here is your microphone. Uh, hi, John. It's Anna, and uh, I have one question: uh, How we can uh, get the information about uh, email to whom registry manager who, who will receive this? <laughs> where we, we can uh, put our voice, our agree or disagree. Of course, it will be agree, but. So, so there is a link, I believe, in the slides, but if not, I will make sure to add it to the slides. Um, you can also go to the ICANN.org website and look up um, DNS abuse amendments, but I, I will add something if it's not in the slides for you. If you are a registry or a registrar, you will be directly contacted um, with information on how to vote. And if you don't vote, then we will contact you again. So we, we will be spending a lot of effort on making sure that all of the registries and registrars are aware um, that they have this opportunity to vote. So I, I don't worry about missing it. this message yeah don't don't, don't don't worry we want everybody to vote so if you miss it um somebody will phone you email you um we need 90 percent of the registrars so we need we we need everybody to vote thank you john thank you Thank you, Anna. And we also have another question from Zoom, from Maxim. Well, it was, it's, it's not a question really, it's a remark, but I'm going to read it in English. Might not be relevant now for us due to lack of trust. Average contract change usually takes uh, three, four years. Uh, it was a, a question about DAAR, I believe.
yeah, that was a statement, not not really a question. Um, and you know, these contract changes do normally take a long time, and that is why the contracted parties decided to f- focus on a very narrow change, because frankly, um, it takes too long, and it's, people have been looking at the industry to take action for many years, and. I have to say it has been wonderful to see the industry step forward and make these changes. So hopefully we will get this done. Well, I can see that there aren't any further questions, uh, so we will... Uh, move on. So thank you for joining us again. So good to see you, as always. Yes, th- thank you very much. And uh, hopefully the next time I can get there in person. I just got off an aeroplane last night uh, to get get home. So <laughs> thank you very much, everybody.